I have called you before, Mother, but you were always busy or isolated. I have something particular to say. Because I prefer saying such a thing. I want... I want you to come and see me. I want to see you not through the machine. I want to speak to you not through this wearisome machine. Why not? You talk as if a god had made the machine. I believe that you pray to it when you are unhappy. Men made it, do not forget that. Great men, but men. The machine is much, but it is not everything. I see something like you in this plate, but I do not see you. I hear something like you through this telephone, but I do not hear you. That is why I want you to come. Pay me a visit, so that we can meet face to face, and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. The airship barely takes two days to fly between me and you. Why? I do not get them anywhere else. Do you not know of four big stars that form an oblong, and three stars close together in the middle of the oblong, and hanging from these stars, three other stars? I had an idea that they were like a man. The four big stars are the man's shoulders and his knees. The three stars in the middle are like the belts that men wore once, and the three stars hanging are like a sword. Men carry swords about with them, to kill animals and other men. In the airship. The truth is that I want to see these stars again. They are curious stars. I want to see them not from the airship, but from the surface of the earth as our ancestors did, thousands of years ago. I want to visit the surface of the Earth. Mother, you must come, if only to explain to me what is the harm of visiting the surface of the Earth. I know, of course I shall take all precautions and... Well? Do you mean by that, contrary to the machine? In a sense, but... I will not talk to you, until you come. Have you been on the surface of the Earth since we spoke last? Why? Not yet. I will not tell you through the machine. I have been threatened with homelessness. I have been threatened with homelessness, and I could not tell you such a thing through the machine. I have been outside since I spoke to you last. The tremendous thing has happened, and they have discovered me. I did not get an egress ion permit. I found out a way of my own. Why? You are beginning to worship the machine. You think it irreligious of me to have found out a way of my own. It was just what the committee thought when they threatened me with homelessness.
so it is always opposed. Well, the book is wrong, for I have been out on my feet. You know that we have lost the sense of space. We say space is annihilated, but we have annihilated not space, but the sense thereof. We have lost a part of ourselves. I, determined to recover it, and I began by walking up and down the platform of the railway outside my room. Up and down, until I was tired, and so did recapture the meaning of far and near. Near is a place to which I can get quickly on my feet, not a place to which the train or the airship will take me quickly. Far is a place to which I cannot get quickly on my feet, the vomit are is far. Though I could be there in 38 seconds by summoning the train. Man is the measure. That was my first lesson. Man's feet are the measure for distance, his hands are the measure for ownership, his body is the measure for all that is lovable and desirable and strong. Then I went further, it was then that I called to you for the first time, and you would not come. This city, as you know, is built deep beneath the surface of the earth, with only the vomitories protruding. Having paced the platform outside my own room, I took the lift to the next platform and paced that also, and so with each in turn, until I came to the topmost, above which begins the earth. All the platforms were exactly alike, and all that I gained by visiting them was to develop my sense of space and my muscles. I think I should have been content with this. It is not a little thing. But as I walked and brooded, it occurred to me that our cities had been built in the days when men still breathed the outer air, and that there had been ventilation shafts for the workmen. I could think of nothing but these ventilation shafts. Had they been destroyed by all the food tubes and medicine tubes and music tubes that the machine has evolved lately? Or did traces of them remain? One thing was certain. If I came upon them anywhere, it would be in the railway tunnels of the topmost story. Everywhere else, all space was accounted for. I am telling my story quickly, but don't think that I was not a coward or that your answers never depressed me. It is not the proper thing, it is not mechanical, it is not decent to walk along a railway tunnel. I did not fear that I might tread upon a live rail and be killed. I feared something far more intangible doing what was not contemplated by the machine. Then I said to myself, man is the measure. And I went, and after many visits I found an opening. The tunnels, of course, were lighted. Everything is light, artificial light. Darkness is the exception. So when I saw a black gap in the tiles, I knew that it was an exception, and rejoiced. I put in my arm, I could put in no more at first, and waved it round and round in ecstasy. I loosened another tile, and put in my head, and shoved it into the darkness. I am coming, I shall do it yet. And my voice reverberated down endless passages. I seemed to hear the spirits of those dead workmen who had returned each evening to the starlight and to their wives, and all the generations who had lived in the open air called back to me, you will do it yet, you are coming. Then it rained past. It rushed by me, but I thrust my head and arms into the hole. I had done enough for one day, so I crawled back to the platform, went down in the lift, and summoned my bed. Ah, what dreams. And again I called you, and again you refused. But I had got back the sense of space and a man cannot rest then. I determined to get in at the hole and climb the shaft. And so I exercised my arms. Day after day I went through ridiculous movements, until my flesh ached, and I could hang by my hands and hold the pillow of my bed outstretched for many minutes. Then I summoned a respirator, and started. It was easy at first. The mortar had somehow rotted, and I soon pushed some more tiles in, and clambered after them into the darkness, and the spirits of the dead comforted me. I don't know what I mean by that. I just say what I felt. I felt, for the first time, that the protest had been lodged against corruption, and that even as the dead were comforting me, so I was comforting the unborn. I felt that humanity existed, and that it existed without clothes. How can I possibly explain this? 
It was naked, humanity seemed naked, and all these tubes and buttons and machineries neither came into the world with us, nor will they follow us out, nor do they matter supremely while we are here. Had I been strong, I would have torn off every garment I had, and gone out into the outer air unswaddled. But this is not for me, nor perhaps for my generation. I climbed with my respirator and my hygienic clothes and my dietetic tabloids. Better thus than not at all. There was a ladder, made of some primeval metal. The light from the railway fell upon its lowest rungs, and I saw that it led straight upwards out of the rubble at the bottom of the shaft. Perhaps our ancestors ran up and down it a dozen times daily, in their building. As I climbed, the rough edges cut through my gloves so that my hands bled. The light helped me for a little, and then came darkness and, worse still, silence which pierced my ears like a sword. The machine hums. Did you know that? It hum penetrates our blood, and may even guide our thoughts. Who knows? I was getting beyond its power. Then I thought, this silence means that I am doing wrong. But I heard voices in the silence, and again they strengthened me. He laughed. I had need of them. The next moment I cracked my head against something. I had reached one of those pneumatic stoppers that defend us from the outer air. You may have noticed them know the airship. Pitch dark, my feet on the rungs of an invisible ladder, my hands cut. I cannot explain how I live through this part, but the voices still comforted me, and I felt for fascinating. The stopper, I suppose, was about eight feet across. I passed my hand over it as far as I could reach. It was perfectly smooth. I felt it almost to the center. Not quite to the center, for my arm was too short. Then the voice said, jump. It is worth it. There may be a handle in the center, and you may catch hold of it and so come to us your own way. And if there is no handle, so that you may fall and are dashed to pieces, it is still worth it. You will still come to us your own way. So I jumped. There was a handle, and... There was a handle, and I did catch it. I hung glanced over the darkness and heard the hum of these workings as the last whisper in a dying dream. All the things I had cared about and all the people I had spoken to through tubes appeared infinitely little. Meanwhile the handle revolved. My weight had set something in motion and I span slowly, and then... I cannot describe it. I was lying with my face to the sunshine. Blood poured from my nose and ears and I heard a tremendous roaring. The stopper, with me clinging to it, had simply been blown out of the earth, and the air that we made down here was escaping through the vent into the air above. It burst up like a fountain. I crawled back to it, for the upper air hurts, and, as it were, I took great sips from the edge. My respirator had flown goodness knows where, my clothes were torn. I just lay with my lips close to the hole, and I sipped until the bleeding stopped. You can imagine nothing so curious. This hollow in the grass, I will speak of it in a minute. The sun shining into it, not brilliantly but through marble clouds. The peace, the nonchalance, the sense of space, and, brushing my cheek, the roaring fountain of our artificial air. Soon I spied my respirator, bobbing up and down in the current high above my head, and higher still were many airships. But no one ever looks out of their ships, and in any case they could not have picked me up. There I was, stranded. The sun shone a little way down the shaft, and revealed the topmost rung of the ladder, but it was hopeless trying to reach it. I should either have been tossed up again by the escape, or else have fallen in, and died. I could only lie on the grass, sipping and sipping, and from time to time glancing around me. I knew that I was in Wessex for I had taken care to go to a lecture on the subject before starting. Wessex lies above the room in which we are talking now. It was once an important state. Its kings held all the southern coast from the Andredwald to Cornwall, while the Wandsdyke protected them on the north, running over the high ground. The lecturer was only concerned with the rise of Wessex, so I do not know how long it remained an international power, nor would knowledge have assisted me. To tell the truth I could do nothing but laugh, during this part. 
There was I, with a pneumatic stopper by my side and a respirator bobbing over my head, imprisoned, all three of us, in a grass-grown hollow that was edged with fern. Lucky for me that it was a hollow, for the air began to fall back into it and to fill it as water fills a bowl. I could crawl about. Presently I stood. I breathed a mixture, in which the air the curse predominated whenever I tried to climb the sides. This was not so bad. I had not lost my tabloids and remained ridiculously cheerful, and as for the machine, I forgot about it altogether. My one aim now was to get to the top, where the ferns were, and to view whatever objects lay beyond. I rushed the slope. The new air was still too bitter for me and I came rolling back, after a momentary vision of something gray. The sun grew very feeble, and I remembered that he was in Scorpio. I had been to a lecture on that too. If the sun is in Scorpio, and you are in Wessex, it means that you must be as quick as you can, or it will get too dark. This is the first bit of useful information I have ever got from a lecture, and I expect it will be the last. It made me try frantically to breathe the new air, and to advance as far as I dared out of my pond. The hollow filled so slowly. At times I thought that the fountain played with less vigor. My respirator seemed to dance nearer the earth. The roar was decreasing. I don't think this is interesting you. The rest will interest you even less. There are no ideas in it, and I wish that I had not troubled you to come. We are two different, mother. It was evening before I climbed the bank. The sun had very nearly slipped out of the sky by this time, and I could not get a good view. You, who have just crossed the roof of the world, will not want to hear an account of the little hills that I saw, low colorless hills. But to me they were living and the turf that covered them was a skin, under which their muscles rippled, and I felt that those hills had called with incalculable force to men in the past, and that men had loved them. Now they sleep, perhaps forever. They commune with humanity in dreams. Happy the man, happy the woman, who awakes the hills of Wessex. For though they sleep, they will never die. Cannot you see, cannot all you lecturers see, that it is we that are dying, and that down here the only thing that really lives in the machine? We created the machine, to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. It was robbed us of the sense of space and of the sense of touch. It has blurred every human relation and narrowed down love to a carnal act. It has paralyzed our bodies and our wills, and now it compels us to worship it. The machine develops, but not on our lives. The machine proceeds, but not to our goal. We only exist as the blood corpuscles that course through its arteries, and if it could work without us, it would let us die. Oh, I have no remedy, or, at least, only one, to tell men again and again that I have seen the hills of Wessex as in day alike, where it saw them when he overthrew the Danes. So the sun set. I forgot to mention that a belt of mist lay between my hill and other hills, and that it was the color of pearl. I had meant to tell you the rest, but I cannot. I know that I cannot. Goodbye. Oh, that. You would like to hear about civilization? Certainly. Had I got to where my respirator fell down? By no means. My respirator fell about sunset. I had mentioned that the fountain seemed feebler, had I not? About sunset, it let the respirator fall. As I said, I had entirely forgotten about the machine, and I paid no great attention at the time, being occupied with other things. I had my pool of air, into which I could dip when the outer keenness became intolerable, and which would possibly remain for days provided that no wind sprang up to disperse it. Not until it was too late did I realize what the stoppage of the escape implied. You see, the gap in the tunnel had been mended. The mending apparatus, the mending apparatus, was after me. One other warning I had, 
but I neglected it. The sky at night was clearer than it had been in the day, and the moon, which was about half the sky behind the sun, shone into the dell at moments quite brightly. I was in my usual place, on the boundary between the two atmospheres, when I thought I saw something dark move across the bottom of the dell, and vanish into the shaft. In my folly, I ran down. I bent over and listened, and I thought I heard a faint scraping noise in the depths. At this, but it was too late, I took alarm. I determined to put on my respirator and to walk right out of the dell. But my respirator had gone. I knew exactly where it had fallen, between the stopper and the aperture, and I could even feel the mark that it had made in the turf. It had gone, and I realized that something evil was at work, and I had better escape to the other air, and, if I must die, die running towards the cloud that had been the color of a pearl. I never started. Out of the shaft, it is too horrible. A worm, a long white worm, had crawled out of the shaft and gliding over the moonlit grass. I screamed. I did everything that I should not have done. I stamped upon the creature instead of flying from it, and it had once curled round the ankle. Then we fought. The worm let me run all over the dell, but edged up my leg as I ran. Help! I cried. That part is too awful. It belongs to the part that you will never know. Help! I cried. Why cannot we suffer in silence? Help! I cried. When my feet were wound together, I fell, I was dragged away from the deer ferns and the living hills, and past the great metal stopper, I can tell you this part, and I thought it might save me again if I caught hold of the handle. It also was enwrapped, it also. Oh, the whole dell was full of the things. They were searching it in all directions, they were denuding it, and the white snouts of others peeped out of the hole, ready if needed. Everything that could be moved they brought, brushwood, bundles of fern, everything, and down we all went intertwined into hell. The last things that I saw, ere the stopper closed after us, were certain stars, and I felt that the man of my sword lived in the sky. For I did fight, I fought till the very end, and it was only my head hitting against the ladder that quieted me. I woke up in this room. The worms had vanished. I was surrounded by artificial air, artificial light, artificial peace, and my friends were calling to me down speaking to know whether I had come across any new ideas lately. I wish it would. I prefer the mercy of God. Yes. Yes. They were left where they perished for our edification. A few crawled away, but they perished, too. Who can doubt it? And so with the homeless of our own day. The surface of the earth supports life no longer in... No. No. Because I have seen them. Because I have seen her in the twilight. Because she came to my help when I called. Because she, too, was entangled by the worms and, luckier than I, was killed by one of them piercing her throat. Mother. The machine stops. The machine stops. The machine is stopping, I know it, I know the signs. Here, I am here. No, none for us. Quicker, I am dying, but we touch, we talk, not through the machine. We have come back to our own. We die, but we have recaptured life, as it was in Wessex, when Zegriai overthrew the Danes. We know what they know outside, they who dwelt in the cloud that is the color of the pearl.
I have seen them, spoken to them, loved them. They are hiding in the midst of the ferns until our civilization stops. Today they are the homeless, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Never. Never. We have learned.